But this morning I want to talk about Isaiah 61. And there's so many interesting things in especially the first four or five verses of the book of, or the chapter of Isaiah 61. But I want to focus this morning particularly on the first two verses. We'll get there shortly. But I want to share something with you first. Listen closely to this short story. There was a quote by a man named Hudson Taylor. If you know much about the mission field, you probably know the name Hudson Taylor. He said this, China is not to be won for Christ quietly. Ease loving men and women. The stamp of men and women we need is such as will put Jesus into China to save souls. First and foremost is the goal. In everything and in every time, even life itself must become secondary. Now, while that seems a little twisted, a little confusing, I want you to ponder the thoughts of this. A quiet Christian is an unknown Christian. A quiet Christian is someone who you may never understand or know is a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. But a man that stands up bold for his faith and puts his feet to the grindstone to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to a broken and hurting world, that is a man that God will use. And to be honest, God has asked every single one of us to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, in September of 1853, Hudson Taylor boarded a little three-masted clipper ship and quietly left a harbor in Liverpool. He was 21 years old when he left to go on the mission field. There was a few dozen other missionaries with him, but Hudson stood out among the crowd. He was not like most other missionaries. He felt as though most other missionaries, especially in the Far East at this time, were worldly. They focused on their funds, who was supporting them, who they hung out with, whether it was businessmen or diplomats. They put the gospel second. And Hudson Taylor was appalled by this behavior. Taylor wanted the Christian faith to be taken into China, into the depths, because he knew at this point that many had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the time Hudson died, over a half century later, China was viewed as one of the most fertile, challenging mission fields, and thousands upon thousands continue to minister there every year. I believe, I believe that this is a powerful lesson to us all. There are some who will not take you seriously when you talk about Jesus Christ and the gospel of his saving grace and why he died on a cross for you and for the other person. First, they will not believe it because they could not possibly fathom that somebody would willingly give up their life for them. But it's true. Secondly, they just might not want to hear the gospel at all because they do not want to submit to someone who is more greater and more powerful than they will ever be. Pride will step in the way and they will turn a deaf ear to God's gospel truth. The fact is this, we've been called to present this message to a broken and hurting world. We've been commanded in Matthew chapter 28 to do so. Hudson Taylor today is recognized by some standards as a radical in his teachings and how he presented that gospel truth. However, I want you to listen to me and how he presented the gospel. He didn't muddy up the waters. He presented the truth for what it was in God's good book. He didn't add to it. He didn't take away from it. He didn't dumb it down. But he presented it in its entirety. And many souls were saved because of Hudson's obedience 
to the call that Christ had put on his life. It's amazing that he knew this call at even a young age. And as he lay prostrate in his mother and father's living room floor at the age of 17, he had an unspeakable joy when Christ entered his heart. And he knew at that very moment that he was called to present that gospel to a broken and hurting world. Some would say today that Hudson may have been offensive. Can I be honest with you? As we've discussed over the last few months, sometimes when we are in the midst of sin and we are carrying shame and guilt, we may feel offended by God's gospel. That's called conviction. God wants us to turn around and go the other way. It's not condemnation. Radical, present the truth for what it is. No different from what Jesus Christ did in his day. And to be honest with you, friends, it's no different from what we're supposed to believe and what we're supposed to do in our own lives if we're obedient to the call of Christ today. So I have to ask you, what is the glue that holds your faith together? What are your beliefs? Who has Christ called you to be? Some questions you need to ask yourself today. What has Christ convicted you to do? Remember, the gospel's not offensive if we're walking with the Lord. But let's take a look this morning. Yes, I said we're going to be in Isaiah 61, but we're going to go to Luke chapter 4, and you will understand why in just a few moments. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And the news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up and read the scroll of the prophet of Isaiah. He walked to the wall where slots would have been in the synagogue wall and he deliberately and he intentionally went to the slot where Isaiah 61 was. Why would he pick that scroll? Why would he want people to hear what Isaiah 61 had to say? Well, let's listen. As he began to unroll it, he found the place where it was written these words. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But that's not all of that chapter. The first two verses, and then he stops. Why, may you ask? He rolled it up, he gave it back to the attendant, then he sat down. His eyes, everyone's eyes were pointed at Jesus at this point. But he just sat there. He began saying to them after a few moments, Today the scripture is fulfilled in what you're hearing All spoke well of him and were amazed at first. They gave words of graciousness from their lips to him. But someone said, isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me. And we'll understand why here in just a minute. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me. Do you hear in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum? Verse 24, he says, Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet will be accepted in his hometown. It's a lot of information, but I want you to listen very closely this morning because there's a lot of information that you need to take in. Jesus came from his trial in the desert. His temptation had been completed just before he spoke in the synagogue on this day. And at this point, he was stronger than ever. 
Friends, I want you to understand something. When you go through a trial, when you go through a hardship in your life, when you lean on the Lord for all that you need, you will be strengthened because God's grace is given to you when you ask Him to. And it's His strength that causes you to be able to accomplish things in your life that you never thought possible. God's strength. And he came back stronger than ever because he had, let's just say, passed the test, passed the temptation. Jesus was sinless. And he sent the devil running off with his tail stuck between his legs on that very day. And he was charged, rejuvenated, and revived. Friends, you must understand that when you come through a hardship and God gives you that strength to overcome that hardship, you will be rejuvenated and revived as well. God will give you power that's unfathomable to overcome trials and temptations in your life. And so we must trust on his wonderful promises and accept his gift of grace in order that we be able to overcome these things. But there's no better example of God's grace here than what we see in how Christ overcame the temptations. He could have fallen into utter ruin even as a son of God. Yes, he was God, but he was also God in flesh. He chose not to fall into those temptations. Friends, we can't do that. We have to stay away. We have to stay strong. Does that mean we're going to pass every test? That we're going to overcome every temptation? Absolutely not. But when we do, God's grace again is more than sufficient to pick us up out of the miry mess and the clay that we've been in. He can pull us up out of the pigsty. He can wash us off. He can brush us off and send us back on our way. What a gift of encouragement. Interestingly here, Jesus was from Nazareth, and many knew him, as we read in the text. But many didn't believe who he was. Many didn't believe that he, the son of a carpenter, was the Messiah that he just spoke about. Friends, it's no different than today. It really is not. Many have been called by God and pushed down by man's opinions. Just this past week, I read about a preacher who harmlessly made a like on a particular post on a friend's Facebook page. And the public began to rip him apart until the government of the city where his church was pulled their funding from their crisis ministry and pulled their funding from where they were meeting in a high school. No different from today. No good deed, you think, may go unpunished, but I want you to understand something. When trials come, when you feel like you're being persecuted and maybe God has abandoned you, it is the opportunity for God to work in a mighty way in your life. So you must walk in obedience. And the people that were around him that day said, this is the son of a carpenter. Yes, absolutely right. He was a carpenter. He is a carpenter. Guess what he does? He's the builder of men. He's the restorer of hearts. He can tear down any wall that's in the way. He can revive any garden and allow it to grow again. So friends, I've got to ask you, what needs to be healed in your life? And Christ was in the synagogue in the midst of his teaching and worshiping God himself, his Father in heaven, our Father too, in the midst of this. He said, is there anyone, if there is anyone who did not go to church or did go to church, it was Jesus. He was always there and he was giving glory to his Father in heaven. Friends, we cannot neglect the meeting together, as some do. Because if we do, we will become comfortable, we will be complacent, and God will not have an opportunity to use us as he sees fit. We must be about our Father's business. We must be obedient to the call that Christ has on our hearts. But in the synagogue, there was a usual order to service. And let me clear this up a little bit so that you can sort of understand where the text is going this morning. They opened with prayer and praise. Friends, we did the same thing this morning. 
we had announcements. We prayed that the Lord would work in this room in a mighty way this morning. And then we praised the Lord in worship and song. We need to understand something about worship. It's not about what I get, but it's about what I give to my Heavenly Father. Praise His holy name in worship. Then there was a reading of the law, Scripture, and then a reading from the prophets. There would be a sermon on that, a short teaching. And on this day, Jesus was the learned teacher, the visitor. And since the synagogue was in Nazareth, Jesus would have, ten, have attended on a regular basis. And now it was his turn to teach in his own hometown. I want you to listen to me real quick about something that was in the verses earlier. It says that he was anointed as Tessa would clear up for us a lot she says she has a fun fact so this morning I have a fun fact for you the fun fact is this the anointed one is the one that's talking and speaking the words of the anointed one kind of chokes me up a little bit that he gave the words to the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years before he read this Jesus gave the words to Isaiah Isaiah wrote them down and as we learned last week it's almost as if Isaiah stepped through time to be able to experience and see firsthand what happened to Christ in his crucifixion in his persecution but here we see Isaiah once again writing God Almighty's words down and then God Almighty reading them. It doesn't get any better than that. So the anointed one is reading about the anointed one. And when we look at the word anoint, it means to rub on or to sprinkle, to apply an agent or an ointment, a liquid. And in those days when the prophets would write they literally would have the Pharisees and the teachers of the law pour oil over their heads and it would run down from top to bottom. This would cleanse them. This would purify them. And it was a semblance that they were clean on the inside just as they were being cleaned on the outside. Is there anything on the outside of your life that needs to be wiped clean? that needs to be dressed or addressed do you need to be washed with the blood of Christ today I want you to understand something as we continue to read through this just as baptism this was an outward expression of the inward purity of the prophet or the teacher that was writing in God's law in his book another point to note another fun fact Jesus was also anointed before his death with oil, with a perfume. And the main ingredient in that perfume was the animal fat from a lamb. The disciples first thought this was wasteful. And yet the anointed one here is being prepared for burial, being cleansed outwardly. He's already clean on the inside. But sadly, so often we don't see these things. We don't see truths that are presented to us, and we have to ask and we have to debate. We want one more miracle. We want one more truth. And the whole time that Jesus Christ was here on the earth, there was one thing after another that happened around him and happened through him, and they still questioned, just as they did here. And as Christ reads Isaiah 61, he is announcing that he is the one who came to take care of sin, the damage that it causes, and do a great work of redemption in the life of those who would come to him and repent and ask for forgiveness. He came to do these things, to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives to recover sight to the blind and give liberty to the oppressed 
If you're broken hearted, Christ is the one who can heal you. You can't heal yourself. Your best life now is walking in the footsteps of Christ and asking him to lead and guide you. He can make things right. He did not come only to preach deliverance or to bring deliverance. Jesus Christ is deliverance. And he came to set captives free. He came to break chains. And he's the lover of liberty. And he's the ultimate lover of you. So where is your heart today? He, he came to proclaim the year of the Lord when he speaks these first two verses. It is the year of Jubilee as we talked about this morning in Sunday school. But he goes one step further. He says, I will set the captives free and I will give them a new start. Sin won't have you down forever. When you repent and give your heart to Jesus Christ, he makes all things new. Dear Lord, don't we need a new start every day? I know I do. Before my feet hit the floor sometimes, I already need to ask for forgiveness. Before I roll out of bed, I've had a stupid thought that I need to be forgiven for. But he gives us an opportunity. And when he stops reading at verse 2, Here's where the legalism comes in. They think that it's an improper thing, that he has blasphemed God's word. The entire scroll should have been read, but he stopped at verse 2. Why may you ask? Because prophecy had been fulfilled up to this point. He had come. He was there now. And verses 1 and 2 are played out. In his death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 3. At the beginning of verse 3. It will be when he returns. It will be when he returns. So up to this point between verses 2 and 3, we have something specific. We have a gap. 2,000 years of a gap. There's a comma, if you will, between these two verses because he has not come back yet. But he will, and he will come not as a meek, humble servant, but he will come as a conquering king. And he will come to take his children home. He proclaims this very day that Scripture has been fulfilled in what you have heard in verses 1 and 2. It's as if he says this bluntly without having to say it. Whom did Isaiah write about? He wrote about me. And they didn't believe. When will it come to pass? Jesus said, now. And their hearts refused to see the truth that was in front of their, their face. And as he began to speak to them, he was gracious to them. And he loved them. He has come. And they chose not to accept it. Even though they sensed a fullness of graciousness and love in his heart, they simply wanted to admit that this was Joseph's son, the son of a carpenter. How in the world can a carpenter redeem us? Because he's a builder of men. He's a builder of men. And there's no way this man could ever be a prophet, let alone the Savior of the world. But oh, he is. He most certainly is. They wanted him to prove a claim. They wanted one more miracle. They wanted one more proof. But he chose not to. The fact is this. The miracle was in the fact that he was there with them that day. And he loved them right where they were. And he loved them in spite of them, and he loves us in spite of us too. Because he is a gracious, loving God that loves us unconditionally. <clears throat> and he desires a relationship with us. They said, if you're the Messiah, save yourself. Well, they also asked the same question of him when he was hanging on the cross. But he willingly gave up his life so that you and I can have eternal life. He willingly, willingly, willingly allowed himself to be laid in a grave 
wrapped in burial clothes. But it was for the purpose that on the third day he would exit and all of the sin, the hurt, the shame, and the guilt that was laid upon him would be left in that tomb. However, it was easier for Nazareth to reject him because they were familiar with him. But I want you to understand something. An imperfect man can be called to do great things. If God puts it on his heart and they walk in obedience to him, it's as if this, a former alcoholic may be a preacher one day. A former murderer may be a pastor. A man who is divorced becomes a great missionary. And all Jesus is saying is, why don't you believe? Why don't you believe? We should ask Jesus to do this very thing for us. To help us with our unbelief. Help us with our unbelief. God can cause anything if we trust and put our faith in Him. But here we see the audience that has surrounded Jesus. They just wanted special favors because He was in His own hometown. And He pointed this out. Those things don't matter to God. What matters is do you have faith in me? Do you believe in me? They wanted something such as a miracle like Elijah had performed when he had the prophets of Baal snuffed out with hellfire and brimstone. Or Elisha, say for example, when he raised the young man that may have been 10 or 12 years old back from the dead or made an axe head float back up to the top of the river. They wanted something that was visible. Well, they had the visible thing, the miracle, right before them, and they chose not to see. But Jesus makes the point here that they are rejecting the one who can save them. And they don't believe because their belief is based on what they see. Verse 28 says, All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. Then they got up, they drove him out of the town, and they took him to the brow of the hill which the town was built in order that they throw him off the cliff but he listened to this very carefully here is a point they wanted a miracle they just got it verse 30 but he walked right through the crowd and he went on his way I do believe that he did not just walk through the crowd and have to bump shoulders as he came through here is what I believe. Just as when they came looking for him in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he says to these soldiers, Who is it that you're looking for? He said, We are looking for the one who is called Christ. He said, I am. And they all fell back. I believe when they tried to put their hands on Jesus that day, the crowd split just as he had split the sea before and just as the soldiers would later do when he just plainly proclaimed, I am. And he walked right through the crowd. It doesn't say that he met opposition. It doesn't say that anybody was able to grab him. He walked right through. You want a sermon? He just gave them a sermon. And he gave them the proof visually. But they were angry. They felt that he had done something wrong because they were stuck in the rituals and traditions. And the fact that he said that he came to set the captives free, the captives of the Gentiles. Well, wait a minute. <clears throat> if you came to set the captives free and the captives are Gentiles, then what about the Jewish people? Because we're supposed to take priority. Absolutely not. God loves each and every one of us. He loves us all the same. It doesn't matter if we're red, yellow, black, and white. We're all precious in God's sight. We all bleed the same color blood, as far as I know. We're no different. We're all his children. We're all his creation. And he came to set us free. And he came to pave a path to that salvation. And he is standing at the end of that path, waiting on us to come to him, to see that truth, to set ourselves down in front of him, prostrate, and ask him to forgive us of our rotten deeds. But their desire was to throw him off a cliff and stone him to death because he didn't fit their mold. 
of what a savior should look like. They wanted someone who would overthrow the Roman government. But what they got was a humble, meek son of God who came to set the captives free. What truth are you refusing to see? What truth has God laid before you that you have not been willing to recognize? What miracle has God shown you that you have not accepted as coming from God's hand? Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Have you received forgiveness? Have you accepted it? Have you embraced it? Do you know? Do you know? That he came to save the wretched people like you and me. On our best day, we're filthy rags. Absolutely true. But God's grace is absolutely amazing. God's grace will turn the most hardened of people into a wonderful believer in Jesus Christ. So I beg to ask you this morning... Just as the first quote that we read this morning, Hudson Taylor said that China needed Christ. But I want to carry that one step further. The world needs Jesus Christ. It doesn't need a quiet, easy, loving man or woman, but it needs one who will stand up in holy boldness and proclaim the year of the Lord to set the captives free, to stamp out men being clenched in chains and bound, to give sight back to the blind, to restore souls. But friends, they won't know how your soul can be restored unless you present that truth to them. The fact is this. One thing I can tell you about Hudson Taylor is his mission work was not about him. He was called a radical. He was called offensive. He was put off by people who spent more time trying to gain funds than presenting the gospel. Jesus was appalled by the lovers of money. He said it's the root of all evil when you focus on the love of money. What Jesus Christ came to do was to save and to set the captives free. And so I ask you this question. Who do you know today? Who do you know today that needs to know the Savior of the world? Who do you know today that needs to be set free? Don't you think it's time to stand up and maybe be called a radical? for the gospel of Jesus Christ, to stand in holy boldness of your faith in order that someone may be set free. If you, if you have heard this, if you have heard what Jesus Christ said he could and would do in just those first two verses this morning, then it's time to do that very thing today. It's time. It's time for us not to continue to sit idly by and see a world come apart at the seams and one more soul go to hell because they haven't heard the gospel if you've not believed then I suggest this one thing that you ask Jesus Christ to help you with your unbelief call on his name today call on his name and you will be saved because he said if you confess with your mouth and you believe with your heart that Christ was raised from the dead then you will be saved it is just that easy but then we turn from our sin and we walk in the other direction because we were once lost but now we've been found and it is the anointed one Jesus Christ the Messiah that came to set us free. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I would ask this of you today. Make that right. If there is a burden on your heart, give that to the Lord today. He said, come to me, all of you who are weary and
and heavy burdened, and I will, I will give you rest. 